Good morning. A story, a story from the Talmud. A rabbi asked his students, how do you know the first moment of dawn has arrived? After a great silence, one student pipes up. Is it when you can tell the difference between a sheep and a dog? The rabbi shakes his head, no. Another offers, is it when you can tell the difference between a fig tree and an olive tree? Again, the rabbi shakes his head, no. There are no other answers. The rabbi circles their silence and walks between them. You know the first moment of dawn has arrived when you can look into the eyes of another human being and see yourself. Let us worship together. As Joyce lights our chat. The most recent current event in which mental illness has been reported about in a prominent way was that shocking and tragic airline crash in Europe last month in which the pilot appears to have deliberately crashed the plane, killing himself and the other 149 passengers aboard. And after the crash, investigation revealed that the pilot had been receiving treatment for his mental illness. It's a tragic and horrific story, and it's a story that I think doubly says something to us about the stigma of mental illness. I can't imagine what that pilot felt or had been experiencing mentally. I don't think any of us can. But we do know that throughout our world, many people refuse treatment, avoid help, or keep their own or their loved one's mental health illnesses secret because of the stigma of mental illness in society and the self-stigmatization that one may feel towards one's own illness. As one pilot writes, Stigma may deter airline pilots from pursuing treatment for depression and the special medical certificate required for them to be cleared to work. Pilots have a reputation for being high achievers, competent, dutiful, disciplined, assertive, confident, and calm in in dangerous situations. But stigma tells pilots that mental illness is a weakness, and that conflicts with those pilot traits they hold most dear. Again, I have no way of knowing what was going on with that pilot, but it's entirely plausible that part of what led him to get to the place where he did was a sense of shame and stigma that he carried. And there's, of course, a second way that stigma ties into this news story, and that's the way that this story may contribute to societal stigma of mental illness by linking mental illness with sensational stories, with mass murders and plane crashes and things of that sort. Part of the stigma of mental illness is that people react to mental illness by becoming afraid, uncomfortable, or judgmental. One psychologist has even created a term for these kinds of reactions to people with mental illness, and he calls this reaction saneism. Saneism, writes psychologist Michael Perlin, is an irrational prejudice against people with mental illness and is of the same quality and character as other irrational prejudices, such as racism, sexism, homophobia, and ethnic bigotry. Attitudes such as people with mental illness are erratic, deviant, emotionally unstable, superstitious, lazy, ignorant. They demonstrate primitive morality or are invariably more dangerous than people without Those are all examples of sanest thinking. Sanism, I might add, is only reporting about mental illness when there's a plane crash or some other terrible news story that casts mental illness in its worst possible light. But the truth we know is that mental illness is extremely common. How common? One source I consulted claims that one out of three Americans suffer from a mental illness each year. 
Another source gave slightly different statistics claiming one in four adults or approximately 61.5 million Americans will experience a mental disorder in any given year. Whether it's one in three or one in four or one in five, that's a lot. And those are just impersonal statistics. So let's make it more immediate. I will tell you that I can't think of anyone who's ever come and met with me for pastoral care in which the person has not shared with me that mental illness has played a significant role in that person's story. It might be their own mental illness they're facing or the mental illness of a partner or a parent or a child or, or someone else close to them or someone else from their history. But I can't recall a time it has not come up. And often the person will, will ask me if they're the first person I've ever met with whatever illnesses it is they have. And I'm, I'm always like, yeah, the first one today or, or the first this week. And oftentimes I've noticed a person will say about their own story that they're sharing with me, well, I bet having someone come and tell you this is making your day interesting. And I, and I once actually responded the, the wrong way. I once said, well, you're actually not that interesting, which, which, was, which was like a major, you know, which was, the, which was the wrong thing to say. Um, a little levity here. So, One of my colleagues writes of doing a service on the topic of mental illness. She writes, it was one of the most profound services ever because I asked the congregation to be vulnerable together in this way. As I prepared to read a list of mental illnesses and disorders from the National Association for Mental Illness website, the NAMI website, I asked the congregants to listen, and then after, not during, but after I had read the list, to stand up, if they were comfortable doing so, if, some, if they or someone they love lives with any of the illnesses on the list. I completed the list, and then 68 of the 70 people in church stood up. We stood in silent witness and it served, at least in those moments, to let us know that we're not alone. Another one of my colleagues writes something extremely similar. She says, I'm a community minister whose ministry is focused on mental health issues. The single most effective way I have discovered to combat stigma about mental illness is to have a church service focused on it in which I or a respected member of the congregation, like Susan, stands up and tells their story. Then at the end of the service, I ask people to rise in body or spirit if they or someone they love is living with mental health difficulty. Usually 80% or more of the people stand up, and they're all amazed at how many other people are standing up. And then at coffee hour, there's a buzz with people telling each other their connections. This simple exercise has made the church a safe place to talk about mental health. The combination of having someone who is respected telling a poignant personal story and asking the congregation to physically witness to the effects of mental illness seems to be magic that dispels stigma. And actually, as I did my research, I found more than a dozen examples of UU ministers doing the kind of the stand if your family's been affected type of exercise, which is to say that, that we ministers are not that interesting or original. And if we did the exercise this morning, I'd be standing too. I'd be standing too. Look around the room. We'd, we'd all be standing, almost all of us. Earlier this year, several parishioners mentioned to me that there's been a tradition here of preaching about mental illness from time to time. A sermon subject would be offered on the subject. I'm told that the sermons that are most remembered among those who've been members here for a long time are the biographical sermons about people who are famous for some special talent but who also lived with a mental illness. The sermon might be about a famous musician like Mozart or Beethoven or um, like the music that Glenn played as the prelude this morning, Brian Wilson, the lead singer of the Beach Boys, who himself suffered from a mental health challenge. Or the sermon might be about a famous painter like Vincent van Gogh, or a famous scientist like Albert Einstein, or a famous mathematician like John Nash. It's true, there is a significant correlation between creativity and genius and mental illnesses. 
One of my favorite examples of the positive impact of mental illness doesn't have to do, though, with beautiful music or the insight that comes from genius. There have been actually a large number of psychological experiments done on a phenomenon called depressive realism. Has anyone ever heard of depressive realism before? What depressive realism says is that people with mild depression actually per perceive reality better than people who aren't depressed and also better than people who are seriously depressed. In one such experiment of the many that have been done on this phenomenon, people were given a set, uh, subjects were given a set of tasks to complete and then asked to self-evaluate, to kind of report out on how they had done on the task at hand. People without depression thought they had done a great job. They could point to all the things, oh yes, I did great on this, I did wonderful on this, I'm really skilled at this, um, when in fact they weren't. <laughs> and people with severe depression thought they had did horribly, thought they didn't get a single task correct and it had just been an utter failure that they had done horribly when in fact they hadn't. But it's actually people with mild depression, it was found, were able to most accurately assess how they had done. They had perceived reality with the greatest accuracy. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? There's a story from an ancient religious text that talks about mental health and the stigma of mental health. It's a story in the Gospels. Um, it's the story of Jesus healing the Gerasene demoniac. And as I tell it, many of you have probably heard this story before, as I tell it, I want to ask you to reserve judgment and just sort of listen to the story, and then I'll, I'll do a little interpretation of it afterwards. So the story goes like this. The story, arrive, the story goes that Jesus arrives in the land of the Gerasenes and encounters a man who is living among the tombs on the outskirts of town. The man is howling in torment and afflicting harm upon himself, bruising himself with stones. And the people of the town, we're told, had tried several times to kind of lock him up, um, but each time he had broken the chains and fled to the outskirts. Jesus asks the man his name, and a voice from within the man says, I am Legion. And then it gets really bizarre. Jesus orders the unclean spirits that were tormenting this man to leave, and the spirits leave the man and enter a herd of swine, a herd of pigs on the mountainside, and the pigs run into the sea and drown. Like I told you, it gets a little weird. The townspeople hear about what has happened and come to investigate, and they find the man who had been ill, and he's clothed, and he's in his right mind, and he is sitting there with Jesus, having a conversation. And the town people react to this in an interesting way. They become afraid, and they, sell, they tell Jesus it's time for him to leave. Interesting twist at the end. So let me say that this passage, let me say first of all about this passage, this passage has been used in a lot of harmful ways in talking about the intersection of faith and mental illness. The passage has been used many times to suggest that faith or believing in Jesus is an acceptable treatment for mental illness. And there's been a lot of people who have been hurt this way. A lot of people hurt this way. The Bible is not a medical textbook. It's not meant to be used that way. And another way this passage has been used in a harmful way is that it causes people to think of mental illness as, as demon possession or in terms of evil or unclean spirits. And mental illness just isn't caused by a person's weakness or sin or moral shortcomings. And to the extent that the passage implies that, it is harmful in that way as well. Others interpret this passage in, in other interesting ways. Some people have said that it's not about mental health at all. It's a political allegory for the Roman occupation of Israel. It's clearly political allegory, they say. The name of the demon is the name for the Roman army, legion. I mean, how much more obvious could it be? It would be like, you know, somebody who we see in society acting um, you know, in a way, that, uh, in a way that that's, doesn't seem normal to us and then saying, oh, that person has Fox News-itis. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's how political, that's how political this is. And how do you cure Legion? Oh, it's, it's by, obviously by sending them into, what is it, the, 
the bodies of the, the, the animal that's not allowed, that, the pig, and then driving the pig into the sea. Political allegory. But the reading, I think, is helpful on a third level. On a third level. There is a third way of reading this text, and that is to kind of ask, what is it that Jesus in this story does? How does he act? Where does he go? And we find Jesus, first of all, being involved in direct engagement, actually going to the man where he is. He personalizes. He asks, what is your name? And then brings this man back, brings him back from being an outcast on the outskirts, from shame, from marginalization, from stigma, back into community. And he sees this person sees his humanity, sees him not for illness, but as a person. A story from the Talmud, a rabbi asks his students, how do you know the first moment of the dawn has arrived? After a great silence, one student pipes up. Oh, it's when you can tell the difference between a sheep and a dog. The rabbi shakes his head no. Another offers, it's when you can tell the difference between a fig tree and an olive tree. And the rabbi shakes his head no. And there are no other answers. The students are quiet. The rabbi circles their silence and walks between them and says, the moment that you can tell that the dawn has arrived is not the moment when you can judge the differences between people. It's that moment when you can look into the eyes of another human being and see yourself. It's that moment where you can see the similarities. My hope for this beloved community is one of wellness. It's one where people move towards health and being well being whole. It's one of safety. It's one where people feel safe to be themselves. It's one where there's peace, where people are at peace with themselves and with others. And it's one of acceptance, acceptance for all of us. So whatever else we do, may we move towards this, whatever else we do, May we look beyond choosing to see the differences, but instead choose to be able to see the similarities that come with the dawning of each new day. Amen.